Good morning, everyone. Such a full room, love it. <laughs> um, I'm here today to talk to you about um, the role that biology is playing with regards to fashion tech and materials. So who am I? Most of you might know who I am. My name is Muchinati Kapunde. It's a bit of a mouthful. I am the founder of Fashionerd.com. And at Fashionerd, we write a lot about the merge of fashion with technology. We translate it in a fashion voice. Um, and the reason why I started writing about fashion tech was because I felt like a lot of the blogs that were out there writing about wearable technology and what was going on in the fashion tech space were so technical. Like nobody understood what exactly they were selling. They didn't understand how technology could play a role within the fashion industry. So I decided to start Fashion Nerd and just start talking about it in a way that consumers and the industry can appreciate technology. Also, um, I'm an innovation consultant. So this means basically that I work with fashion brands. I tell them what kind of technology is out there and how they can embrace it, adopt it, and also learn about it. Um, I'm a speaker. Obviously, I'm on stage. Um, I've been speaking for three years now. And the whole thing that I do about speaking is basically I give people an overview of the industry. I wouldn't call myself an expert. I'm more of a I keep my fingers in a lot of pies and I'm able to tell you what's going on within the fashion tech space. So, you know, I wanted to start with a question. I'm probably going to end with a question as well. Um, how can we make textiles and fashion industry more sustainable? We all know that the fashion industry is feeling the pressure to basically be sustainable. And a lot of them don't quite know how to go about doing it. There's a lot of greenwashing that is taking place at the moment where brands are basically telling consumers that they are sustainable and they're, they're doing A, B, C, D, but they're not really that sustainable. So one area where I feel fashion and technology is playing a role is in material design. A lot of people um, who are scientists are solving this problem by coming up with new materials that the fashion industry can use. So this is basically what I'm going to be talking about with you today. Um, I'm going to do it a little different. Um, my whole entire presentation is going to be based on talking a little bit about the 10 top innovations that I find are amazing and then showing you a video because I can talk to you about a product, I can tell you how great it is, but when you actually watch a video and it shows you how it comes about and the person who's behind the brand tells you why they're doing it, it's a little different. So I kind of decided to show you quite a few videos so you can kind of get an idea of what material design is and the role that it can play within the industry. So let's begin. Um, the first topic I'm going to talk about is leather. Most of you might already know how many scientists have come up with a way of creating a new type of leather that doesn't need animal waste, doesn't need to use animals for it. And they're finding a way of growing leather in a lab, which we can then use as an alternative. One of the pioneers in this space is Suzanne Lee, and she works for Modern Meadow. And they came up with Zoa. And Zoa was a, was a t-shirt that they created using faux leather. And what I think is great about Modern Meadow is that they actually managed to take an idea, create a product, and showcase that product. A lot of ideas when it comes to material design always end up as just an idea. They end up as a prototype in a lab. They never see the day of light. So this particular product was actually showcased in New York a couple of years ago. So it gave consumers an idea of what the leather will feel like. Is it something that's actually, you know, mass, can be mass produced? And they were able to show that it can be. So I'm going to play this video here that kind of gives you an idea and um, gives you kind of a feeling about the particular brand itself and what their objective is. Can we have a bit of volume, please? Thank you. 
So that's Zoa, and it's a leather that they grew in the lab. Um, when I showcased this, I did this talk on Tuesday, and I think um, someone said, what if we grow leather? Will it still be interesting? Because a lot of people like the fact that leather is, is kind of has a different feel. It's animal material. It has kind of a sexiness about it. And the idea that we will start using lab-grown leather would take away that kind of excitement. I mean, just out of curiosity, a show of hands, how many of you would wear products grown in a lab? A few of you. Okay. I'm just curious, only because I'm a big believer that we do need to find new materials and that we do need to find a way of not being the second biggest polluter in the world. So I'm a big fan of grown leather. And it was quite interesting when she kind of said that um, because I felt a bit like, well, that's a different perspective. Um, here's another brand who's also... Um, creating new leather. They're called Microworks. They've been around for quite a while. Um, they're not new, but what I do like about them is that they keep things interesting and they came up with this idea a few years back and they're still kind of trying to find a way of bringing it to the mainstream. Um, and they've used mycelium, which is simply put, is mushroom, and they've found a way of basically creating this fantastic leather. Let me just play this video so it gives you an idea of um, the properties that it brings to the table. I mean, to me, that is fantastic. They looked to nature. They came up with a, an amazing type of material that can be dyed. It's strong. It can be turned into a handbag. You can use it to make shoes, you know. And they basically doing that with mushrooms. And I think that when the people come up with such ideas, the fashion industry does need to stand up and take notice because we, it's something that is... It's a change that needs to happen, basically, when it comes to um, using the materials that we use right now. Um, this section here... Um, is brands that have found a way to be inspired by nature when it comes to materials. Most of you, I'm sure most of you have heard of Bolt Threads. They've been in the press for about two to three years now. They've worked with brands like Stella McCartney, and um, they are doing amazing things in this space. And what I find quite interesting about Bolt Threads is that they're scientists. They don't work in the fashion industry, they know nothing about the fashion industry, but what they are, they're problem solvers. And they found a way of creating a silk that is a replica of how spiders create like their webs and whatnot. So um, uh, they're going to basically talk in this video about what inspired them and how they came up with this fascinating idea. There are only 31 types of fiber in the world. And the last new one really came around at the end of World War II. But since that period of time, almost nothing has happened. And so the market is always hungry for innovation. And here we are. I personally am very passionate about how we think about using the limited resources we have around us as we continue growing this planet. I'm also fascinated by technology and making the impossible possible. We have a rich history here at Bolt Threads of taking on challenges we never thought we could solve and come up with solutions that become commonplace years later. Textiles is the second dirtiest industry on the planet after oil. And it largely stems from the fact that it's an industry that every human being on the planet consumes the product, so the scale is massive. So we make fibers by starting out and looking out in nature to find the protein spiders make that's the silk polymer. We copy that DNA, put it inside of a yeast cell. We grow it in a giant fermenter, 
and then those yeast, while they're eating sugar, are pumping out this spider silk protein. We collect it, purify it, and then extrude it, much like you would a nylon or a viscose fiber. And at the end of its life cycle, that protein can be broken down by any cell on the planet. The first product that we ever made out of the silk is a men's tie. It was quite a feat to be able to work with the fiber at this point, and it represents the very first product that we completed. The second product that we did was a hat. So often you mix two fibers together because you want one attribute of one fiber and you want another attribute from the other fiber. So we chose a very nice soft merino wool and we blended our silk fiber with it and we got an even softer product out of that. Our biggest collaboration has been our relationship with Stella McCartney. Material innovation is incredibly important to us and more and more every day actually looking at recycled materials, looking at biodegradable materials, and we're now working with a brand new technology in making our flower bags out of a Milo material, which is actually groundbreaking technology, and it can change and shift an entire industry. You know, working with someone like Bolt Threads means that the fashion industry can actually be in the future and be modern and be game changers. <laughs> The reason we put all this technology in place is the business potential is immense. I think we saw last year and the years before uh, a building appetite for sustainability and features in the things we buy, our footwear, our apparel, our accessories. And that's one of the things that motivates myself, my co-founders, and I think everybody here at Bolt uh, is to put real things in the market and see real change rather than just manufacture knowledge. This process is really what I like to think of as the factory of the future. I think the future holds a lot of different fibers that have different characteristics. We can program those characteristics into our protein and then they express in the fiber. So we can make stretchy fibers, we can make strong fibers, we can make very soft fibers. There's an infinite palette of things we can do. I think the key takeaway with this is collaboration is, is something that we need to do. It's, you know, when it comes to coming up with new materials, we simply cannot, as a fashion industry, come up with a solution ourselves. It's imperative that we collaborate with scientists, you know, and we collaborate with architectures and people who are from other industries and we come together and we come up with a solution. Um, but the good news is most universities these days are teaching fashion students not only how to design, but also how to be scientists as well. And I think this is key. Um, we all kind of need to be able to work together in order to solve a problem. And I think Bolt Threads working with Stella McCartney is a great example of how this can work and um, hopefully make us a bit more sustainable than we are currently. The second project I want to share with you um, is about Diana. Diana came up with an idea of using like nature to create fabric. So imagine like the roots of a plant and creating that into fabric, which I think is very fascinating. And even though you might say, you know, her project is a bit out there, you know, how can you make roots into a fabric? How can you make that into textile? I think it's more about the idea behind it and the potential of what we can really do than actually the product itself. Because it's literally, it's just a prototype. It's an idea, it's a thought. And I think that's where we need to begin first. So let me share with you her video and her thoughts. And she kind of will probably elaborate a little bit more than I have. And it'll give you a better idea um, about what she's actually trying to achieve. Diana Scherer, and I'm an artist. I work with plant roots. I'm actually a plant root weaver. I weave the plant root system below ground. Also, I'm a photographer. I make photographs of the work. It started with a root-bound image. Root-bound is when you leave a plant for a long period in a pot and you remove it um, then you will see this amazing root system. 
So I, in this time, I really explored the differences between, for example, grass. Grass is really silky. Uh, I compare it with yarn. It's very thin and white uh, and soft. So I learned about the structures, the strength, also about the processes below ground, for example, um, the communication of the root system. So this is fascinating, and for my work, they don't really need to communicate, but I work with the dynamics, the strength and the search for food and water, which is kind of the energy I use for, for the weaving process. Yeah, this lawn is made from oats. It's two weeks old, um, and it's ready to harvest. And here I easily can cut the soil from the root system. I was curious how would these two better grow into each other. Also, I'm very curious because I never know what happens every time it looks different than I expected. I see myself as an artist, I am an artist. And I think my first approach was a very romantic uh, approach with the root system. Of course, to explore it uh, in a certain way, but I didn't want to solve problems. And on a certain moment, I found out that there's more, that I can develop a material. This is a dry piece of the dress, so I can remove it. Almost no soil on it. I'm not very happy with the stains. Um, this happens in the winter often. It's a rotten process. Um, but on the other hand, there are some wild edges which I like. I always use um, for the dress also a piece of normally grown um, roots. You see it in the dress here, for example. I find it important to show how the plant root would grow in nature in combination with my intervention. At the moment it's still very fragile, but uh, an interesting part of the work is it's almost a self-growing material. It's a new material, it's a biofabricated material. I mean, I could make kilometers of these. Of course, it needs my templates and my manipulation, but then um, the whole weaving process is made by nature. It's almost that I discovered paint and now I have to learn painting. And there's two different things, discovering a paint and learning to create with it. I mean, who knew you could use the roots of a plant to create material? Um, and for me, myself, I find that very exciting, very fascinating that there's lady has found a way of using nature to come up with a fabric that none of us really would have ever considered. Um, this is another one which um, most people kind of, kind of rise their nose up to because it's the idea of creating material using cow manure. So how can we do that? Um, there's plenty of cow manure everywhere, so it's not something that is rare. Um, and what they've done is said, okay, this is waste that we kind of just get rid of and throw away. How can we then use that to create material? And I think one thing you should all keep in mind is that a lot of these innovators are finding ways to use our waste. Instead of throwing it away, how can we take that and make something that we can continue to use? How can we close that loop? So I'm just going to play this video to kind of give you an idea of how they kind of were inspired to use cow poop, I guess, simply put.
as short as that video is, I think something you should take away is the fact that it's not the poop itself, it's actually the properties in that poop that they were using to create the fabric. Um, so there is no poopy smell or anything like that. It's just kind of looking at something and saying, how can we create something using waste? Um, another company um, is Elginit. They were actually at the key house last season. I think they were part of Sustainable Innovations. And Sustainable Innovations is a booth that's right at the back. So make sure you pop down and have a look. Um, and they have been really um, celebrated within the kind of sustainable fashion space because they've come up with this amazing idea that is actually viable and can be used by brands. So I will let you tell, let them tell you themselves about their product rather than I kind of tell you what about it. Here we go. Let's play the video. Fashion is one of the top polluting industries in the world. The lack of good alternative materials is a big problem that we often forget about. The world as we know it could change completely, and many people ask if we can stop this change. We believe that we can, and the next generation of materials will be a part of the solution. I'm Tessa, and I am a co-founder at Algenet. Algenet is a biomaterials innovation company. We are a group of designers and scientists creating durable, compostable, and cost-competitive yarns derived from organisms like kelp. We are offering better alternatives to synthetic textiles. Kelp is one of the fastest growing, most rapidly replenishing organisms on Earth and acts as a filtration system for our oceans. Working with this organism, we are able to produce a material that's flexible and formable, and that doesn't dissolve in water. Durable and practical, it fits into existing textile production methods and can be knit both by machine and by hand. With kelp, we are able to create a yarn that fits within the fashion ecosystem so that we can produce it at a cost competitive scale. Algenet's production process has a minimal carbon footprint and fits into a closed loop life cycle by utilizing plant-based materials that are non-toxic and even safe to eat. When our material wears out, rather than ending up in landfills, it becomes food for organisms in the ocean and on land. We believe that the next generation's commitment to sustainability will only grow, defining consumer needs to be not just harmless, but globally beneficial. We are aiming to inspire the next generation of closed loop products that operate within a circular economy, enabling designers and consumers to transform the fashion ecosystem. What I like about this startup is that they have achieved two things. Um, when it comes to new materials, there's two major problems that a lot of people face. The first one is cost. It's simply too expensive for a designer to come in and get a bit of the material and create a collection with it. They can't afford it. And the second is manufacturing it. The machines that are used at the moment in manufacturing just cannot really create, um, cannot create product using that particular material. So you need to actually invest in new machines. Where's that money going to come from? Because a lot of the factories, um, I don't know if you guys know this, when they uh, get new machines, they probably enter a contract of 15 years or so. So therefore, how are they going to then you know, buy new machines in order to kind of work with this type of material? So what Algonit have managed to do is find a way of making it cost effective. And they've also found a way of people being able to use that material um, and create it in factories, which is like the two major problems that a lot of material designers have found when they're designing new materials. Orange Fiverr. This is one of my most favorite companies right now. Um, they're an Italian startup and they found a way of using orange peel waste to create materials. Why I find them fascinating. Um, Erin Enrica, who's one of the founders of Orange Fiber, actually showcased her dress here at the Key House last season. 
and it was a dress that she made with Salvatore Ferragamo. It was beautiful. But what was amazing about it was that it was made 100% out of orange peel waste. Um, and the funny thing is that it was on display. People were walking past it last season. And when they were told that it was made out of orange peel, everybody wanted to smell it. You know, like, ooh, it's made out of orange peel. Let me smell. And it didn't smell of orange peel. It smelled like normal material. It had that silk feel to it. And I think that most people had to basically feel it, touch it, smell it, see it to believe that a company has found a way of using orange peel waste to come up with the fabric. So I'm just going to play this video, which kind of gives you an idea of how they create this type of material. And one thing that's actually great about Orange Fibers fabric is that it's not 30% orange and then, you know, 70% something else, which is mainly the case with most new materials. They have to blend them with something else in order to be able to use them. Um, but they actually can create it 100%. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have 70% orange fiber and 30% something else. You can. But what makes them different is that they can make it 100% should you wish. Um, another good thing about Orange Fiber is that they are willing to work with small designers. So even though they've worked with big brands like Salvatore Ferragamo, which is very impressive, if you're like a new designer and you would like to experiment with sustainable materials and you would like to work with Orange Fiber, they're actually open to that which I think is key. I don't think that um, people who create new materials should only be appealing to luxury brands. I think they should appeal to everybody because it's not about luxury brands changing their ways. It's about all of us changing the way that we design fashion. So now I'm going to bring in about science, the role that science plays within the fashion industry. So I'm going to play this video and then I'll, I'll give you a bit more background information thereafter. We've been looking at sustainability in materials and design aspects for over 20 years now. And one of the biggest issues has been around how we can make the biggest impact by changing the way the fashion industry works at a systemic level. So what we've been trying to address is how can we think of fashion as doing good and create an industry that can be restorative and circular right from the concept through production and use. The reason we started looking at paper was really thinking about what would be the most recoverable, the most sort of light in production material that we could possibly start with. You know, this isn't strictly speaking paper as we know it. It's a, it's a new material based on paper making. So we have to think of it in, in textile terms because uh, the connotations of, of paper often make people worry that it will melt in the rain or not withstand wear. So we're really trying to produce something that is very practical and new in this way, but by developing the material from the fibre up. The stronger the paper, on the whole, the stiffer it is. And that's not good for wearability. The softer, more wearable it is, 
the weaker it is on the whole. So we can soften it by crushing it so that it's a much more drapey, wearable thing. One of the other issues to do with wearability is this difficulty of there being no stretch. So we're putting mechanical stretch in by trying various ways in which we're steaming the material into some kind of pleats. And we can also introduce to the prototypes that we're constructing a kind of way of joining one to another with an ultrasound bond. The finishes we've been working on here um, range from dyeing, you know, we're, we're changing the colour of the material in various ways, all bio-based natural dyeing systems, through to waterproofing the material, decorative finishes that change the surface qualities, so numerous ways we can really change the behaviour, the function and the aesthetic. One of the most recent, we're still just developing now, is the use of a, a laser to surface the material. And the laser surface and the ultrasound and the pleating all work because of the PLA fiber in the paper. This would not work on 100% wood pulp. So what I'm hoping here is that we can demonstrate some, just some of the possibilities for the new technologies to be fused with the old technologies and actually produce something as a cleaner um, production system. In Sweden, where the project is based, they have incredible resources to make the paper and an industry sort of infrastructure built to produce this material. So we've really adopted and adapted that process in this material development. But we still have to understand how does the consumer behave with those materials. We might have fantastic ways of recycling um, materials when they're finished with, but we need the users to be part of that system to bring the material back um, to the right place. So it's no good looking at materials um, on their own. We have to see them as part of a much bigger um, network and bring that into the design process from the start. I think that when it comes to using paper, it's a very scary idea of using paper as a you know, material, but the way they've done it, they've shown that they can replicate the paper in order to then make it a material that can be used. And also what makes them different is that it's got a short lifespan. Most fashion brands, when they want to use materials, they want it to last as long as possible. But their whole entire concept is we want to give it a short lifespan, you know, and then we can recycle it and then we can create another product using it again. So it's kind of like closing that loop. As most of you might know, when it comes to dyeing of fabrics, Dyeing is toxic, it's got a lot of chemicals. It's a big problem within the fashion industry about how can we dye our fabric without actually damaging our planet? How can we use less water? And dye in general actually even affects our skin. So there are a couple of companies out there that are coming up with ideas of creating a much more natural, sustainable dye. And one of those companies is Colorfix. Initially, we were working on water quality in Asia, and we were going to Nepal and Bangladesh and talking to people about what bothers them in their water. And one thing that came up again and again was the textile industry and the enormous amount of chemicals going into water from there. At that point, we decided there has to be a better way that's closer to nature, and using our synthetic biology, we engineered this way of dyeing, where we use biological driven processes guided by nature. Our process starts with nature. We find a pigment that already exists, let's say from an insect. And using nature, we take that pigment out of its context and apply it to a microorganism, which can then start producing it very efficiently. Using this, we can then take a biologically driven process, the colorific technology, and transfer that pigment efficiently from the organism to the fabric. And this means that we use a lot less chemicals, water, and energy. One of the things that we are able to do now is to effectively take any process, or in this, our case, a pathway that will make color from almost anything in nature and put it into our process, our microbe, and make it make that color. 
the way we leverage the biology is actually not anything to do with the manipulation of the organism per se, but it actually comes from simply realizing that mildew and mold will stain material. The feedstocks that are used in our process are found in fields around the world. The, um, the, the, the molasses that are used in the process are derived from sugar beet crops that will, are found in many, many countries. And certainly most of the countries in the world that are involved in dyeing are also major sugar producers as well. In the fashion industry, people often talk about being inspired by nature. But with Colorifics, we can actually replicate nature. We can take the sections of DNA, that language from DNA, the chapter of DNA, and put that into the organism. So we're actually recreating those pigments as nature is doing at the moment. The breakthrough moment for the Colorifics technology happened once we managed to transfer the dye efficiently from the organism. The process does two things. It combines both the production of the dye and the deposition and fixation of the dye into a single step. So we can access this by using biology to produce the dye so we can get microbes to make the dye. And we can also use those same microbes to uh, infiltrate the fabric and deposit and fix the fabric with the dye. Our organism self-replicating so we can go from basically a couple of organisms to you know, hundreds and thousands of millions of organisms. When we lice, when we kill the organisms to release the color, they're also releasing the salts and metals that are used in the fixing process. So with Colorifics, we don't need to use mordanting agents, we don't need to use those chromates, etc., because the organisms themselves harvest those chemicals for us. I think that the consumer demands a level of transparency and more ethical business, you know, and I decided to work with Colorifix because, again, it's a technology that's a real game changer. I mean, the process in which they manage and use dyeing is, is just extraordinary. They're finding new ways to look at the dyeing process without, you know, without less harmful chemicals and toxins, but I guess the biggest achievement that they have is using 10 times less water in the process of dyeing. And for me, that's, you know, that can change the industry, that can help the planet that we work on and live on and you know I just find it incredibly exciting. I mean, if you're curious about the dyeing methods that are available at the moment, I would recommend you go down to Sustainable Innovation stand in the back. Um, they have two people who are kind of presenting natural and more sustainable ways of dyeing fabric using waste and also using um, fruits and vegetables and so forth. So if this, this is kind of your thing, make sure that you pop down there and have a look and then you can touch the material and whatnot as well. Um, last of all, I'm going to talk about this t-shirt right here, which you'll see. It's by a company called Volback. Some of you might have heard of them. They are the bad boys of material design. And why do I say this? They like to take impossible tasks and make them possible. Um, and one of the most famous is using graphene, which is, most of you know is one of the hardest materials, using graphene to create a product. And they came up with a collection a couple of years ago, and it was so well written about because the idea that they were able to create this material that was considered impossible and they managed to do it um, was um, very much um, a big thing within the fashion industry. Now, most recently, they came up with this T-shirt. And this T-shirt is all about um, creating a fabric that we can actually wear. And once we're done wearing it, we can throw it in the compost heap and then it will be gone in six weeks. I think it was six to 12 weeks. Um, so imagine having clothes where you c it's made out of a certain material that when you're done with your clothes, instead of actually like um, getting them in, end up in landfills or, or whatnot, you can actually create a compost heap at the back of your garden where all your clothes go to, and then they kind of like disappear back into nature. And this is that the whole entire concept is how can we get rid of the waste? How can we make sure that our clothes don't end up in landfills? Um, and this is an idea that I think is amazing. And if we can actually make this happen uh, and then get the fashion industry on board, I, it could be the future. 
So I'm going to end with a question, because I began with a question. Um, so can biology material design kind of fix fashion's pollution problem? Definitely. I think it begins with education. A lot of the fashion industry don't really know what's going on. So the first step is doing your research, finding out what's going on, who's creating what materials, you know, how can I get hold of this material? Can I grab some samples? Kind of asking questions. Because once you know about something, you're more willing to adopt it. And I think this is the kind of the lesson for the fashion industry. Um, so before I end my talk, I just want to give you a few key takeaways. Um, the first one being the kind of collaboration of science and fashion is a must. Science is helping us solve a problem, which is a very good thing. A second key takeaway is ask questions. You know, find out a lot more about what's going on in the textile industry. We all know that the textile industry itself is very traditional, but there is a new kid in town, and that new kid is basically a new material. So ask questions, find out, you know, go and find out who Volback is, you know, what they're up to. And then that way, hopefully, the industry will be less shy about adopting new materials. Thank you so much.